So, uh, as you know, my name is John Lindsay Poland, and um, I, I consider myself both a scholar and an activist. Um, I have always liked to have each of those inform each other, right? I think a lot of um, social change work, a lot of activism is about doing, right? And people are like, feel the urgency and want to do shit. And, um, and that's really important. But a lot of times that means that it's not informed by history, it's not informed by uh, data about the community that we're working with. Um, and at the same time, a lot of times uh, scholarly work is not connected to the real world and it's not accountable to the real world. So I'll talk about a little bit about that more in a bit too. Um, so, uh, and you know, I um, have been doing research and activism like, I don't know, 40 years or something like that, I guess, depends when you start. Um, and so I'm really happy to share with you about some of the, the ways that I like to do research. Um, and so I'm gonna jump right into this. I like started putting together slides last night and I'm like, there's too many here, but uh, we'll, we'll just see how it goes, right? And um, feel free to like jump in as we go. Um, and, uh, uh, but hopefully there will be also some space to like have some more back and forth as well. Can I give a formal introduction that we... Oh, we'll see. <laughs> so John Lindsay Poland is a writer, activist, researcher, and analyst focused on the Americas. He has extensive research experience in an organizational background of Mexico and Colombia. In 2012, he participated in the U.S.-Mexico Caravan for Peace and currently coordinates the project Stop U.S. Arms to Mexico. For his work on Colombia, from, from 1989 to 2014, he served as a coordinator of the Task Force on Latin America and the Caribbean as part of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. For a little over a decade, he was also the editor for the Latin American Update. Between his time working, John has contributed numerous reports and articles from publications ranging from the San Francisco Chronicle and the Berkeley side to Al Jazeera and the Huffington Post. Lastly, John has written several books such as Inside Panama, Embers in the Jungle, The Hidden History of the U.S. in Panama, and Plan Colombia, U.S. Ally Atrocities in Community Activism, just three of his, of his many books on U.S. involvement and intervention in Latin America. Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, so, um, I wanna say a, a few things about, in general, about, about doing research that's, that's connected to social change work. Um, and then talk about some specific uh, types of research and paths that I've followed and, and some findings. Um, so uh, one of the first things I like to talk about is that when we are researching about war or human rights violations or militarism or um, state violence, or even or non-state violence, it's hard information to hold. It is, it's about people hurting other people and or preparing to hurt other people or organizing to hurt other people or organizing to control other people and stop their movement or, uh, and so it's information that when, it, when we hold it, it has a certain toxicity um, and I think a lot of people actually shy away from news, shy away from analysis of these issues because they think they can't do anything. They think that there's nothing to do. And so if they have to hold it, it's just going to hurt them. And in my experience, the best way for me, for my mental health, is to do something with it. Now that could be writing about it, it could be taking action, it could be organizing with other people, but it's, it's taking that information and not just letting it sit in my gut, but to, to do something with other people about it. And that's what transforms it for me. And so I, I say that because I think it's really important when we, when we get into this stuff to be aware 
of how toxic it is. When we see, see things that are, they're, maybe they're very normalized, or maybe they're very coded, um, or maybe they're like super sensationalized, like right in your face. But any way around, you're holding something that is, it, it's, um, it's sad, it's angering, it can make you bitter, and so you, you have to take care of it, like be really careful with it, like any kind of toxic material. Um, so that's, that's kind of just one thing I want to say about it. Um, you know, um, I do think that in, the, in academia, a lot of times it's like, it's all about what's interesting. <laughs> right? What is interesting? And um, that's a very, you know, it's like if you're going to hold it in your head, right? You're going you're gonna to work with it in your head. And I am really interested in knowledge for a purpose. It has some kind of um, reason for, for looking for it. Um, uh, and that, that then guides you. That, that then makes it a totally different enterprise. Intellectually, socially, um, technically. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are activists who say, oh, well, if we could get some grad students to work on this, this would be great, you know. We'd get them to do all the data entry, or whatever, you know. Um, or we get them to analyze it. And often activists don't realize that academics are working with a totally different framework, right? Different timelines, different uh, paths of accountability. Um, uh, and different relationship to the material sometimes, a lot of times. Um, journalists are a little bit closer because they, their timelines tend to be really quick um, and they are willing to work with, like sometimes the legitimacy of information or of knowledge for academics has this, you know, has all these different things in it, you know, not just the, you know, the, the ethical board review, but, but other types of standards that um, journalists are like, I'm gonna go talk with the person. If the person says this to me, and if the person is credible, if I can back it up, then I'm gonna print it, or I'm gonna run it. Um, and sometimes that is more useful for activists, to be honest, really. So sometimes, I th you know, working with journalists can be really helpful. It's, it's also true that sometimes working with legislators can be really helpful because legislators can ask questions and sometimes get answers that somebody in the community or even an academic or a journalist can't get, right? Because they have a, a certain type of authority. Um, but I also think that, that it's, uh, the accountability to those who are impacted, like for me, really needs to be part of the work all the way through. Like thinking about, okay, what is it that the... So suppose we're talking about um, human rights violations in, in, in Guatemala. Um, what is it the people in Guatemala who are being impacted by those violations, what do they need? You know, is somebody asking them what they need? Um, who can provide them with what they need? Uh, and what is what I'm doing? How does that connect to that? Like, is it, is it actually part of a process that is going to address impunity or address, you know, the causes for why these violations are happening? Like, how, what is my, the relationship of my investigation to that process? Like, and asking that all the way through. So you can think about it in terms of like, okay, I'm going to report back, right? I, I gather this knowledge, it actually belongs to the people who are most impacted, and I'm going to figure out whatever language justice is required or whatever travel is required, I'm going to figure out how to get it back to them. That's a, that's a really important form of accountability. But I think the other one is, how does it shape the investigation? How does it, like, is it really useful um, to the people who are, who are suffering or being harmed by whatever it is we're looking at? Um, so I think that's just like, I don't know, a piece, a, f a fundamental piece. Um, so um, <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, you know, in, in, in activist work, and I'm great, you know, really glad to hear that most of you are kind of consider yourself activists. Um, there is, um, 
the strategies that we're creating, uh, you know, we need to understand that we're not alone. We need to, um, you know, a lot of times I think both activists and scholars, <clears throat> and I, I make this mistake all the time, we're like, well, the data shows that, you know, we're right, you know, where the data shows that this particular policy intervention would, would work, would change things. Um, but a lot of people are not really influenced that by, by data very much, you know. They're, it can be important, you know, it, it's a, certainly a, a legitimizing factor, um, but a lot of times people are much mo more moved by something that's emotional, right? That's where the journalists come in, that's where testimony comes in, that's where the accountability comes in because the voice of those who are impacted sometimes is the thing that is going to really shift whoever is, you know, sometimes they're like responding to something behind them that you can't even see, right? Donors, interests, look I say, yeah, right? But uh, the emotional stuff is often what's needed and um, it doesn't, um, it sometimes doesn't meet the same standards that academia is, is, is requiring of you, right? You might be like, I heard this testimony, I am moved, I'm in. You know, like I'm done, we're, we're on this where. Um, I'm totally convinced that this is the problem, all right, or this is the solution. Um, and a, a lot of people will be, if, if, if they're not moved, they're gonna be like, well, no, you need something more, even if they are moved. So uh, I also think that a lot of times um, there, there is a translation that's needed between the head and the heart, right? We need to figure out, and there's also um, the, the thing that speaks to somebody in the community might not speak to someone in power and vice versa. And so there's a kind of, a, a, a can be a, a translation. Sometimes there's something that will speak to both, but a lot of times I think the work between scholarly work and activism is about figuring out what speaks to each, each group. Um, and you know, there's just the literal translation, right? If you're, if you're working in Mexico, you know, if you're working in Latin America, you're gonna be not working in English primarily. And if you're working in this country, much more you're gonna be working in English than in other languages most of the time, right? If, if, you're, if you're trying to influence things and if you're trying to do research that's for, for some kind of academic um, space. Um, and then also, um, I find a lot of times um, I'm looking at documents and I'm looking at, I'm looking at an Excel spreadsheet and maybe it's showing the number of firearms that have been sold to the Mexican army by month or by year. And it, it, it classifies them by the code of harmonized systems, which is an international trade code, 93110 or military rifles, right? Um, and it's, it's a code that um, covers over the actual import of what you're looking at, right? There's, um, and so I think a lot of times that can be in the vocabulary, it can be in statistical data, it can be um, in, in the way things are formatted, um, that the actual significance of something is hidden. And our work is pulling out, okay, this, this is what this means. This means that they're shipping assault rifles that are banned in this you know, state, by the way but uh, to this entity that is guilty of these human rights violations and, and, uh, and decoding that is a really important part. Um, this is something that uh, Center for Third World Organizing put together long ago, um, just thinking about some of the things I've been just talking about of different types of knowledge. And there's a kind of pyramid where mainstream knowledge it tends to be at the top but it's not most of the knowledge that actually exists. Most of the knowledge is in the community um, and it takes a different form often. It's more experiential, more cultural, um, often exists in art itself um, or in everyday interactions. Um, and bringing those types of knowledge together in ways that doesn't um, privilege 
um, mainstream knowledge over other types of community knowledge um, can be a really important piece of, of the work too. Um, so I wanted to give an example. Um, uh, I don't know, have you ever, any of you heard of Bernard Lafayette? Know who he was? He was, a, he was part of the civil rights movement in the early, early, six, early mid 60s. And um, a lot, you know, in the South, an important part of the struggle was in Selma, Alabama. And um, Selma was a place where, um, you know, there were, I think, like a, 150,000 black people and 150 of them were registered to vote, right? And um, it was seen as this place where you're never gonna win. You can't organize there, nothing's gonna happen there. They've got it wrapped up, right? And that, for Lafayette, it kind of um, struck his curiosity. Like, okay, totally wrapped up? Like, totally unchangeable? Really? Really? So what he did was he, he went to the library there and spent a week in the library to understand the context. What was going on in Selma? What was the history? Who was in power? What was the economy like? How, you know, what attempts had there been made to change things before? What, all, that, all that was what he was interested in looking at before engaging. And um, so sometimes I think that research like, is just critical. That, that background, that trasfondo beneath all of or inside, outside of or around all of what the, whatever it is we're looking at. We might have a fairly narrow research focus, but understanding that context can be super important, particularly for the social change part of it. Um, so now I'm going to like turn to militarism um, as a subject for research and, and organizing. And you know, I, I just want to note because sometimes people think of militarism as like warfare, or they think of it as just the equipment. Uh, and this is just like some forms internationally, right? We can also talk about it within the United States or within any society. But, um, you know, there are, there's assistance, you know, which is a lot of times what people say, because this is our tax dollars, right? These are how U.S. tax dollars are being used. And that's definitely part of it, especially when the United States goes in big. Um, but on the other hand, operations can be really important. Sometimes, so in Afghanistan and Iraq, Initially, it wasn't an assistance program. The U.S. basically said, these are failed states, we're gonna go in, we're gonna do it ourselves. And sometimes, like right this past week, uh, former uh, Attorney General Bob uh, Barr, Bill, Bill Barr, Will Barr, said, um, we should bring in U.S. military forces into Mexico and go after the cartels, right? Basically because we can't trust our clients on the ground to do it. So we, as U.S. military, we're going to have to do it. Like that's the warfare scenario. That's where that's the invasion scenario, right? But the non-invasion scenario is the assistance one, where we're going to train them, we're going to equip them, we're going to give them lots of resources, we're going to build them up so they can do what we want them to do. Right. So that's where you feel like you have enough trust in your partner, and um, in order to have them complete those objectives. But then there's also sales, right? Which is a much more commercial, self-interested part of militarism, but very important part, um, which I'll, I'll show you a, a little bit later, where you've got companies, uh, many of the big corporations that are selling stuff around the world, and um, they are not, they're not using US tax dollars. They're using the buyer countries to bring in all of that military, militarized equipment. Um, but it has the same impact in many ways as the assistance, right? Because you're, 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 you're deep putting into a society all of these military destructive uh, mechanisms. And then there's the training and preparation. That's the people, the people stuff, right? That's also where you're trying to build up capacity of a, quote, partner military or police force. Um, and it could be anything from the School of the Americas to there's a gazillion of these programs, like the United States. 
every, you know, almost every federal department has them. They exist, exist all around the United States. They do them overseas in the countries where they're doing them. They do all kinds of what they're training in. Um, so that's just myriad. And, um, but also very key because it's also a trust building exercise between the United States and those forces where they're building relationships. And a lot of these guys that they're training are moving up in the ranks and may actually eventually hold, hold civilian power, right, if there's a coup or something else like that. But um, they are building leadership in a way that is uh, answerable to the United States, right? And, you, and then later, the US officials that have been working with them say, oh yeah, I know so-and-so, we can do X, Y, or Z. So, um, now, um, in, in Angela's email to me, um, you're talking about um, the effects of military aid. This might be your question, I don't know. But um, th the premise of a lot of military aid, at least on its face, is that it will increase security. Security meaning less violent conflict. Presumably meaning less violent conflict. Um, for many people like us, um, that is counterintuitive, right? Because you're putting, again, you're putting uh, instruments of destruction, instruments of harm into a conflictive situation. Many times into, you're giving them to actors who have not been accountable for wrongdoing. So when you're doing that, you're, you're increasing the stakes, you're increasing the likelihood and possibility, uh, at least the capacity, for doing more harm. Right, that's, for, for people where I come from, that's the intuitive thing. But for people who are, supporting that kind of state, military, or police assistance, the assumption is these are people who are working to create legitimacy and order in their societies. If there is violent conflict in those societies, they have to reestablish the state's monopoly on the legitimate use of force, legitimate use of violence. And by doing so, they will eliminate that violent conflict because there will no longer be a, le a second or third legitimate uh, actor using force in that society. Um, and that's a very different premise, right? So um, the question that uh, some of my research has gone at is, how do we know? How, how do we know which one of these things is true? Um, and so, I, I've been interested in saying, so, okay, where is the military assistance or police assistance going? And what is the conduct of those who are receiving that assistance or that training or those arms sales? And um, how do we compare that with any other, like can we compare that f with before they got that assistance or that, those weapons? Um, do we compare that with others who have not gotten it? Um, and what are other factors that might also be in, impacting um, those things? So in the case of Colombia, um, this is a map we created a long time ago. This was 2000 to 2009 was like the height of Plan Colombia, when the United States said, okay, we're gonna, um, we're gonna uh, go, F, you know, go into the drug war, but we're gonna do it using counterinsurgency because of course the guerrillas are involved in the drug trade. We're not we're gonna really deal with the paramilitaries who are at the much higher end of the drug trade. Um, and so we're gonna focus our military assistance initially in the southern part of the country where the guerrillas were the strongest. And that's why you see that um, darker area in Caquita in the southern part of Colombia where um, the FARC had a lot of its, um, had concentrated its, its, its guys and gals. So, um, uh, and then you also see uh, up toward the Venezuelan border, Arauca, um, is another uh, dark red area, and that was because after 911, after the, the, the Twin Towers came down, there was a very explicit thing of saying, we're going to protect natural resources, we're going to protect oil. 
and that was a, f a focus for where uh, of a U.S. interest in oil uh, with Occidental Oil's um, investments. So it was very explicit. We're going to assist the 18th Brigade. We're going to assist the 5th Mobile Brigade that are in Arauca, and um, and that's where the assistance was located. Then we compared this uh, variation of military investment with where extraditional executions were happening and by what units. And, you know, we also looked at it over time. So this was the number of soldiers trained versus the number of extraditional executions, which you can see goes way, way, way up. And then the killings eventually go down um, after it becomes a major scandal. So that's where, in some ways, that the descent of that red line is really important to think about wh what activism does. Because, you know, these killings by the army were happening for years and years and they just kept going up because the, the army was, and, and, the, and President Oribe, were rewarding kills as their measure of success in the war. And then family members started to talk about it. And family members were like, no, my son was not a guerrilla. He was not a member of the FARC. He was killed three days after being promised a job in another part of the country. And uh, journalists got involved. The United Nations got involved. Some of the embassies in Colombia got involved. There were some actors within the Colombian state who began to say, ah, yeah, you know, this, is, this could ruin or could affect our international image. And the army did its own investigation that revealed that there had been a whole bunch of these extrajudicial killings, and then they basically stopped all at once. Um, now, that's of course not the end of the story, that was 15 years ago, but um, it is one measure of both how military assistance can affect things, but also how activism can affect things. Um, then, you know, then there's like the more messy and complicated piece, which is around the people. So I interviewed a lot, like uh, f for me, researching is not, it's, it's interviewing the people who are impacted. But I decided I really want to interview the guys who are part of this. So the Colombian military officers. And I was able to get, you know, the, there was a, there was a Colombian general who went to Washington and was basically, after that, that scandal hit, was trying to um, save the Colombian army's image internationally. And so he was actually approaching human rights NGOs and saying, trying to get the Colombian army's story out. And he was a very interesting guy. He was not in combat. He was in logistics and very open in many ways. He, he and I befriended each other. And then he got me these interviews with all these war criminals. Um, so on the left, there's this guy, Hernan Mejia Gutierrez, who early on, even before the scandal broke, was, was tagged as someone who was overseeing extrajudicial executions in his units. He was a, you know, a star, you know, had gotten all these awards, and he had gotten all types of U.S. training. Um, so you, you might think, oh, well, then, you know, there you, there you are, there's an example. But on the other hand, there was this other guy who, um, very well known, who had also had all this U.S. training, um, but he was a kind of a whistleblower within the Army uh, early on in the mid early to mid-2000s and was fired and was kicked out of the Army. Um, so then it's like, okay, w w again, that question, why would we have different results? And it's really hard to suss out, right? There's many different components of any career, of any war criminal, you know, what, what is actually happening. So then I started to look at, okay, there was this data on, um, on School of the Americas, uh, which has now been named the Western Hemisphere Institute for National S for Security Cooperation. Um, and uh, there was um, data on n names of people who had gone there. And, we, and then using other public sources, I was able to create a database of names of officers and when they were in certain units. So I was able to look at by individual officer who had gone to the school in Georgia and been trained by the United States and then gone back to the United States, how many of them were actually implicated in these human rights violations and these extrajudicial ex executions? And as it turned out, a lot more of them were implicated than compared to a bunch of officers who weren't. And, you know, that was a way of actually 
quanti quantitatively measuring it is, you know, a, a fairly small sample, but a, a fairly dramatic difference. Um, so I want to say something about, uh, I'm going to shift uh, out of Columbia now, because um, I increasingly I am more focused on the ways in which the United States as an economy and as a white supremacist settler society um, uses and needs militarism to accomplish its, its goals. And so, uh, because I think that if you only look at government policy, uh, sometimes you miss the, the things that are, that keep things going and keep driving it. And um, so a lot of that I've been looking at um, econo the economies of weapons. And, uh, you know, one of those is like the movie industry is certainly, you know, it certainly helps perpetuate that and is, it's embedded. It's just like people don't even think about it. It's so normalized and the movies help us normalize it. TV helps us normalize it. Um, what are the options on Netflix tonight? We'll see, you know. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, that has its own niche in, in, the gun, in the gun industry and the gun culture, which is very much... Uh, dominated by a white supremacist culture, the history, you know, of the Second Amendment has all of that, but also the way that the NRA has developed has, has done that. Um, how these things are marketed is very much a part of that. And um, it's, it's, you know, like the worst of capitalism and militarism because it's like, oh, well, no, you can't, you can't put any regulations on, on selling a 50 millimeter rifle that can take down a helicopter because that would be going against the Second Amendment. And it's, it sells. Like that argument sells. And um, so uh, I have been, uh, oh, let me, I can just skip over that. Um, so on firearms, so the illegal market for, let me back up a little second. Firearm deaths in Mexico are arguably as the, the homicides with U.S. sourced firearms in Mexico are arguably as many as all gun homicides within the United States. U.S. sourced guns in Mexico. 70% of guns recovered at crime scenes in Mexico, at least, consistently, every year, came from the United States. They may have been produced in another country and then imported into the United States, but the retail market in the United States is so wide open, it's so militarized, it's so enormous, that it is perfect for organized crime. It is the absolute best business model for, for organized crime. Because, and I'll come to that in just a second. But, so I just wanted to mention, uh, I can share this, uh, this, uh, these slides with you. You know, there's a whole bunch of sources on the illegal, illegally trafficked firearms going into Mexico that are coming from legal sources of firearms here. Um, and I'm gonna rush through this because I can't see what time it is. Um, but uh, then there's the, the legal exports of firearms, which, um, uh, these are firearms that are being, uh, if, if we look at Latin America, um, these are legally exported. There's a license to export them. And you can see that Mexico is by far the largest buyer of firearms that are being exported from the United States. Oh, again, legally. Um, then I want to... Um, is that state? Is that from the state or, or general? Is, is the source of the information you mean? No, like... The the, That's, the purchasers? That, it depends on, the, on which country. Okay. So in the, in the court case of Mexico, all firearms are purchased, imported by the Mexican army. That's true in, in Honduras as well. In many other countries, you might have state purchasers, but also private brokers or, or importers. Um, so uh, again, this relationship between assistance and, and sales is a lot of times, and in this case, this is Colombia, but it's also true in other countries, where the United States invests a lot initially, like Plan Colombia or the Merida Initiative, where they put a ton of money into assistance, and then that tapers off. Like the US government, the Congress, they're not gonna keep that level going. But after that, that assistance goes down, you still have sales, and many times the sales have gone up even more. 
So it's really important to look at the sales as a as also a measure of the ways in which all of this military gear or um, is going to other countries. Um, this is just another way of looking at that. This is uh, firearms and related exports from the United States to Mexico. The, when the Merida initiative began in 2007, 2008, it goes way up, even though that wasn't an advertised part of the program, but, uh, and it stays up even after um, all that assistance goes down. Then there's, you know, I'll just, uh, again, I'll kind of skip over this because this is just sources of information for where you can find uh, information. Oh, this is on the legally trafficked, sorry. I come skipping around here a little bit. But so, um, again, the firearms market, this is a map of the number of firearms by municipality in Mexico illegal firearms that were recovered over an eight or nine year period. And then on the US side, the black gun icons represent the number of federally licensed firearms dealers per municipality. And you can just see it's just enormous. There's thousands of them along the US-Mexico border, which allows, again, it's, it's, it's just perfect for organized crime. And then if you, if you zero in, this is a map that we created. And I love maps, by the way. This is like one of the things I really love to do. Is, is to visualize things with maps. And, and this is a way of seeing how in these tiny little towns in the Rio Grande Valley, you've got lots of guns being recovered, you know, just over the border. So all the, you know, the, the guys who kidnapped the four US citizens uh, last week, they're in Matamoros, like, or, or the, the army, well, that's another question. The army also killed five people in Nuevo Laredo, unarmed youth, uh, just a few days before, but, um, uh, you, you know, you, when you look at, at the, on the other side of the border, there's lots and lots of gun dealers that they don't really have a reason for being in these small little Texan towns. Okay, um, déjame ver. Um, I'm going to skip over some things. I'm going to say one other thing, and then uh, one or two other things, and then um, hopefully we can go to conversation. Um, sometimes it's about the question that you start with. So, have you ever, any of you heard of Vieques Puerto Rico? Tu? Y que sabes? Well, that the U.S. had an army base, that um, it left toxins, it contaminated the entire space, children were killed, um, all these things were happening, and people came out and protested for years and created a popular movement, and I think forced the government to do cleanup, is that right? And they forced them to stop the bombing. Stop. That was that was a big piece. Yeah. Yeah. So the navy was. This is a populated island on the eastern side of Puerto Rico, and um, the navy bombed there for more than sixty years um, before they would go off to Europe and the Middle East. And uh, in the late nineties, mid to late nineties, there was a study that showed that there was a higher incidence of cancer on the island, and the only industry there was the navy, right? So. Somebody requested that the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is a US federal agency, do a study about the causes of cancer on the island. So they did a computer model looking at what the Navy was doing, right? How the Navy was dropping these bombs, what, you know, what was it releasing into the air, and they, they did a computer model of that, and they concluded that that was not a cause of cancer on Vieques. But their starting point was the bombing. Their starting point was not the people who were impacted. They weren't looking for why is it people are getting sick? Why are people dying of cancer in Vieques at a higher rate than Puerto Rico, which already has a slightly higher rate? When your starting point is what is in, why are people being impacted, it looks very different. So these are people, these are Puerto Ricans, who said, okay, we're gonna start testing the vegetation. We're gonna start doing DNA samples. We're gonna start testing the soil. And what they found was very elevated levels of cadmium and lead and other heavy metals that are cancer-causing agents. And that leads you to a very different conclusion. And I, for me, that's really important when we think about these research problems that we don't just, that we start with like, who needs the answer to this, this question? Um, and what is causing the, the thing that's, that they are experiencing? That's the, that's the key for me. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as Angela said, you know, it was 
a very successful movement, and people were came out across all you know political persuasions within a very fractured political environment um, in order to get the media. Um, so I think I'm gonna um, call it quits there for now, and um, and see if we could use the last ten minutes to have a conversation or ask questions. I can add the library and anything. Or maybe you have a question about high school, otherwise I can start. Okay. An educational tool. Because like I said, I think a lot of people, um, they're not moved in the same way by the written word or by data or by analysis. Um, there's some analysis in there. The film, filmmaker I'm working with now says, oh yeah, that's more of an informational video, the one you guys made. And I want something more emotional. Um, so it was, it was a good experience. It was very um, involved. Um, there were a lot of different pieces that I didn't anticipate. Like, we didn't do permissions right at the time of doing the interviews. That was a mistake. Um, and so, because we had to go back later. Um, the organization I was working for was very nervous about publishing the whole thing. And so we had to take their name out. And that was even after they had financed it. So that was uh, difficult. Um, I think it was really, and I was working, so I, I worked with the, the guy who did the, sh the shooting of the film in Mexico was different from the person who did the editing here. Both Mexican guys. Um, but having different people meant it, w it was uh, kind of added. It was that was a difficult. That was a challenge. Um, and then you know we've been able to use it and show it, and I'm glad you saw it. I'm interested in what you think. But um, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's the best thing I do. So I don't put as much time in that as into other things. But um, I think it's really important that some people do it. I think we want to open it up to the audience if they have any questions about uh, John's work and research and activism. I have a question, just something I've been thinking about recently with the, the university and education in general. I feel like there's an overabundance of theory and a lack of practice. And I'm curious in which ways that you would think about potentially the university working towards more practice type of work? Mm. So I think some universities are prioritizing, are giving more weight to practice. Um, when you say theory, what do you understand by theory? Just kind of like the way classes are structured, I feel like it's very within certain guidelines of academia and, and how we're supposed to think. And I think the exploration of thought is often discouraged. Hmm. Um, and I think that is done part, partially with the use of grading. Um, it could be a very discouraging tool. Um, so. I'm just always trying to think about ways that we can allow people to be their individual self mm. and show up authentically within these spaces mm. without having to necessarily conform to these certain very specific ways that we're supposed to learn. Well, when you say that, it makes me think that theory is being understood as a fixed given that's coming from the teachers rather than theory being like, what is guiding our action? So when I think about action, I'm like, okay, one of the things practices in, in organization I work for now and in, in, in this project on stopping U.S. arms to Mexico is, what is our theory of change? How do we really understand that these things are going to happen? And is that credible? What are the steps that are required to get there? And are each of those steps credible? in the sense of like, is it really possible that enough 
enough support or opposition will be gathered in order to get from this step to the next step. So for example, there's a theory of change for our work, which is in the United States, the impact of US firearms on Mexicans has to become as important a part of the discourse about firearms as the impact on people within the United States in order to have an impact on policy. That's a theory. It's not, it's not an academic theory, but it is a theory. And it's probably based on other theory. I don't know. I'm not a theoretician. I'm not an academician. Um, but I don't doubt that there are social change theories that uh, could inform that. And probably some people have done some good work. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I think the institutions like uni universities tend to be, um, have a lot of inertia. And so getting them to prioritize more action, to value more engagement of, of um, knowledge and learning and theory with the society in which those institutions live is hard. And um, sometimes people leave the institution in order to do that because it's just like, no, nah, this is not happening here. Sometimes there's enough room to do it according to you know, whatever you need, right? Um, because what I'm hearing also is like, okay, each individual, there needs to be room for individual initiative and thought. D different people are gonna have different needs for that expression and, um, and, and the engagement around it. Um, and so everybody has to make their own call, like, okay, is this, is this a place where I can, where I can make that work? Also to invite um, a realm of sort of new thoughts here because uh, you had a slide that was talking about knowledge and knowledge production earlier. And in that slide you were talking about the power of community to determine these questions and to bring forward a real philosophy that's coming from community. So, and you've mentioned it several times. Okay, the data doesn't always work. The data doesn't uh -huh. know this. And then we see the example of Vieques and what it took to build that kind of popular movement that there were so many pieces in place. And so I guess I was just wondering, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot out of but just to know that your work has been about knowledge and knowledge production, really thinking through this about philosophy. And if there's any insights that you have or ways of being able to um, I guess recognize the power of what that community voice is as it comes forward and it can meet data and all these other things, but that it's, mm -hmm. it has to be in the production of popular power. Well, uh, my reaction was at, at what cost do we sacrifice um, knowledge for emotion? Um, and I'm thinking about Hmm. The, 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 the way you set it out was um, information that's relevant for state agencies versus information that's relevant for social mobilization. Um, <clears throat> my reaction was, why not both, right? So, oh, I wasn't trying to say one or the other. Yeah. yeah but, that's, That's the way it came out. Yeah, okay. the way it came out. Uh -huh. And I was, my reaction was, do we sacrifice mm -hmm. data and information that can be useful for state actors simply for emotional purposes? And uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I don't either. No, I'm, I'm, I'm always into both. <laughs> But it also is also true that sometimes you can present both, yeah. and one gets somebody, and the other doesn't, you know, and vice versa, right? And so um, you don't know sometimes what's going to really reach people. Uh, I always try to use both as much as I can, yeah. um, because 
Yeah, I just think it's both are really important. I don't, I don't, I don't want only the cold, the cold data, um, and and I want the the legitimacy. I mean, really, the voice should be legitimate enough, but sometimes for some people it's not, and. Um, and sometimes it's just the data is a confirmation of what they're saying, of what people are saying, so, which can be reaffirming. And my worry is that, I mean, if we, if, if we have it, if we have it the other way around and we just simply focus on the emotional aspect of the information, um, my worry is that that then becomes um, interpolated as subjective, or particular, right. yep. where I find that communities of color, poor communities, communities that are marginalized, are actually very scientific. You know, testimony is a science. Mm -hmm. You know, an anthropology is considered valid. Um, sociology is considered valid. I think that although some data or some knowledge production in those communities may not be, may not elicit emotion, but I think having that and focusing on that kind of knowledge production, whether it elicits a response, I think it's so important to have. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We're having this conversation now because, so I was just in Mexico two weeks ago and we went to Guerrero again and we had this one long day of um, testimonies. It was like brutal and overwhelming and, um, and beautiful and moving at the same time. And we were with this filmmaker and the filmmaker is he's professional and he's really good and the camera guy was amazing and he's like yeah i want i want an emotion i want people to so he wants to tell the story through one of the people visiting and i'm like okay but we have to center the mexican experiences here and it's like he i keep having to call him back to that um uh, and what that means a lot is that the, the voices that we're hearing in Mexico are people telling about their experience. And, um, and it's very emotional. It's just like super, and it's also concrete. It's like super concrete. This is happening, this has hap happened and happening right now, and these are the actors involved. And, um, and he keeps wanting to say, I wanna, I wanna see how someone visiting, and in this case, the father of someone who was killed in Parkland, in Florida, how he is responding to this testimony and information. I'm like, yeah, okay, and, but, <laughs> so it's, I don't know, it's, it's uh, thinking about, it, it's not just about what is legitimate knowledge or what, you know, it's about what is really, what is going to help people get engaged, and that's, that's what I'm, struggling with right now. I think it goes back to, as a research team, I think we were talking about um, how do we share testimony in the maps or in the work that we're doing currently. Mm -hmm. um, and that even happens in like, you know, the nonprofit world, like how do you share pictures, working with testimony with people, like, mm -hmm. without exploiting, exploiting people. Yeah. Um, and also, like you mentioned, like that toxic information you hold, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's both important to share, but also how do you share it? Especially coming from like a privileged stance of you, like kind of researching mm -hmm. the outside from the university, right? Um, yeah, it reminds me of all of that. So. so you saw this 26 minute film. Did anybody else look at it? Maybe not. What did you think? Like, there are testimonies in that movie. What do you remember? Like, do you feel like, you know, what's your reflection on the use of, there's information in that video, but then there's also these testimonies. I felt like it was very, like, I emotionally was able to connect and, like, understand, like, testimonies. And I feel like it, I know you're, like, worried about, like, the subjective, like, it becoming subjective, but it still felt very, like, objective and very, like, on mm -hmm. point, but, like, still having that emotion that connection. And what was it that did that? 
I don't know, just like hearing them speak and like, just like in Spanish, it felt like my tios and tias like speaking to me, like I was just able to like mm. relate to it and like, uh -huh. it didn't feel like fabricated or fake. It felt like I was there listening to their stories, even though I'm like all the way up here and like not mm -hmm. here. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think there's also sometimes when people are very clearly speaking to a generalized kind of global north saying, this is what is happening in my community, this is what mm. I want you to do about it, and then marking out exactly what's what's been happening. Like most seros that come from communities that are talking to a general population of the United States, to lawmakers, to understanding their role as a as a, a kind of diplomacy within that community. Like that, that that's there. And then these other moments that can sometimes be find themselves on film that might have communities that are created through that, that they, people may accept, yeah, I'd like this to be shared, but it might be shared within people who see a tia, a tio, and, and, you know, like mm -hmm. more familia, having that connection, right. you know? Mm -hmm. And that might be really different than what other people might be able to, like they feel they don't know what to do with that access, or that they may have other ideas that spin because they don't understand that inside space. Right. So that there's different kinds of uh, ways in which testimony itself, you know, can come out um, and be different. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we are thinking of that too and how we put things forward. There's, there's also like different degrees of um, access, I guess I'm, is the word. Um, the people we talked with two weeks ago in Guerrero, their situation is so bad. It's so bad. Like, there were three journalists in the room, and they're talking about how they can't report because if they report, like there's like 30 something armed groups in, in the state of Guerrero. If they report one thing, like one group is telling them, you have to report this. And then the other group is saying, if you report this, you're with them, we're gonna kill you. Like, and then the group that's telling them to report it, if you don't report this, you're with them, we're gonna kill you. So they don't report anything anymore. They stop reporting, which means all these things that are happening in the state that are totally silent, like no, you know, or people are like, you know, nuestra única voz es Abel, Abel Barrera, who is the head of Tlachinoya and a human rights group there. Él es el único, es el ángel que, que llamamos a él porque él es el único que puede actuar en, por nuestra parte. And you're like, and, you know, a woman who said, you know, I, I got a threat and they said they're going to kill me in a week. Um, or a woman who, who hugged Manny, the, the father of the Parkland um, student, and at the end of the meeting and said, pues estamos contando, contando con ustedes, right? Like, we're, we want you to take our voice. It's like, that's a very different thing than like doing interviews with people who are being affected by lead filled water in East Oakland or something, you know, I don't know. Like, it's just, this is a very, it's kind of a different situation. And then one's responsibility, you have, you're like, the responsibility is, in some ways it's the same, but in other ways you're like, holy shit, we really have to, we have to think this through really carefully. And we really, it's urgent that we do something. So, yeah. But this, this uh, scenario is kind of, um I would say it's not unique, but it's kind of certain intimacy with those people talking, you know, like you say, no one know about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my view, one thing that is worrisome when we were talking about um, the way people engage in, what is the side of the, of the researcher, you know? Because the side of, of the people who go to research mm -hmm. in, in communities that have problems, mm -hmm. let's put it here. Um, the site? No, no, sé, no, 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 El sitio del investigador? Yeah, where, where you go to research. You uh -huh. can be researching in, with mm -hmm. arms, you can be researching in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
political protests. You can be protester, and, and and you can be researcher with um, health problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and all of this is politics. Mm -hmm. All of this is politics. The life of the people is is in in individual. And but uh, you know, how about the radio? All of those testimonies. You know, to promote the war in Iraq, it were every day it was a teenager boys, female that say, they killed my family. I am the teenager and I'm forcing they they or say something like Me jalaron el pelo por el radio and you are listening to that voice, you know, the woman is crying and after that, every, you know, every, the government said there is no weapon of mass destruction in Iraq. But people believe, mm -hmm. and this is happening today with many, you know, the conservator, the conserv los conservadores, los, uh, los no conservadores. Entonces, ¿cómo desentangle? Mm -hmm. Because the problem here is people are so in tango, they don't know what to believe. And I think in my my way of seeing as an activist that this is a crucial problem to fight even the sale of arm in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Because there are many testimonies. How people that are not engaged in those fight or in those problems can choose or can hear and give how can we make them to change the, the mind? You know, it's, I know it's difficult. This is a rhetorical question because I know that <laughs> it's not so good, but it's something that is always trouble every research that you do. If it's in, in well, I was working in, in a lot of outbreak epidemic with Indian people in Venezuela, and the, the, you find Fine people, a fine woman, a fine man, a very hardworking, very uh, good father, good friend. And they said, Ah, but es que los indios se mueren porque ellos no tienen cultura. You know, the, the, those are the normal death of the Indian this, this time of the year. Que no cuentan. Ah, lo dicen. Sí. Y entonces, ah, ok. ¿Quién vende las armas? No es, es que esos muchachos están perdidos. Mm -hmm. That's what they said in, in the community. And today, for me, well, I, I, that's what I wanted to, to, I don't know if it's a comentario más o simple to say something. Es, ahí lo diga la dificultad de lo que hacemos los activistas hoy. Mm -hmm. Porque la vehemencia, como tú dices, estar viendo que hay una injusticia y quieres trabajar, well, no es suficiente. Because the other side see the same. Mm -hmm. And they engage with all their gut to do the opposite. Because they believe they have the reason. Claro. Eh... Yo creo que los resultados de una lucha social pues no son predeterminados. Sí. Eh, y eso también quiere decir que lo que hacemos cuenta también. Porque no, no es predeterminado. Ni para ellos ni para nosotros. Ni es permanente. No es fijado. Se podemos lograr algo y después se cambia. Y viceversa, ¿no? Ellos pueden lograr algo y nosotros podemos cambiar. Entonces, no, no, no pienso en algo que, ah, ok, vamos a llegar al mundo en que hemos logrado todo y estamos en la fantasía. No. Pero sí, yo creo que con la, los mensajes de que la gente cuenta, su vida tiene valor. Y hay personas que de pronto o tienen miedo o no saben o no creen que pueden tener un, algún impacto. Eh, 
estas son las personas a donde voy. No las personas que dicen, ah, estos, estos muchachos son así. No, no, no me voy por ellos. Me voy por las personas que están en su casa mirando a Netflix o mirando a lo, lo que sea y, y realmente podrían porque sus valores son consistentes. Pero, pero entonces hay un sesgo. Porque si estoy hablando ahora como researcher, porque solo tienes una historia de la historia. No, no estoy hablando como un researcher, estoy hablando como un activista. In terms of the people I want to reach with the results of my research, I'm talking about that's like, sure, I'm interested in all, when I'm doing research, that's why I interview the military guys. Like, I want to understand, how does this work? You know, like, what is, what is operating here? So I, as a researcher, I'm interested in the official data, which sometimes lies, definitely tells an official part of the story. And then I'm also interested in what people are saying you know, in the community. I mean, that part of it, I want, to, I want to get as complete a picture as possible. But part of that is to understand what is my opposition? But when then I'm doing the, the activism, when I'm mobilizing, when I'm organizing people, I'm, I'm looking for people who are going to do something, could do something, want to do something, believe in doing something. That's a different, you know, that's a different audience. Me explico? Sí, 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 sí. Solamente que, que estoy muy de acuerdo con lo que estás diciendo. Uh -huh. Pero lo que pasa es que hay muchos casos en que eres activista y ni siquiera la gente que está en problemas a veces responde. Claro. Entonces, no. a, veces, sí, claro. a veces ellos, a veces tienen que hacer tú misma una campaña, digo una campaña de concientización con la gente y decir, mira, no, es que se tienen que morir, por lo menos en el caso... Uh, bueno, voy a irme lejos de la historia para no comprometerme <risa> pero entonces a uh, gente de, que, que se está muriendo de diarreas, de cólera y entonces esa gente no quiere hacer nada porque dice no, es que somos así uh -huh. y entonces uh, y tú tienes que llegar a incentivarlos y hablar con ellos y, o, o la gente de repente te dicen eh, las autoridades, los oficiales te dicen no, es que uh, ellos, ellos, ellos no responden, ellos, ellos se les mueren los niños todos los días y no, no sufren. Y entonces vas y te encuentras con personas que, que están muriendo, pero bueno, se murió el niño. Uh -huh. Me imagino que igual con las bandas, los pranes, este, todos los sicarios y todo eso. Todo claro, eso. estamos en un mundo jodido. Pero la verdad es que aún en ese mundo podemos hacer algo que realmente tenga un impacto. En eso es estoy. Y ahí hay que enfocar, porque si, si quedamos en esto de que ay, 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 el mundo con el cambio climático y con el trumpismo y todo esto, bueno, es que no, nos perdimos en casa. And it's a beautiful place to just keep strategizing and finding new ways and new levels. And I just want to hand it back if Romeo, if you had any conclusion remarks. Or yeah, yeah. We just wanted to say mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time. I feel like this discussion has been like very insightful for all of us about like, you know, U.S. involvement in like Latin America and all that. And yeah, just we appreciate you as like a community for like coming. Thank you. Yeah. I'm really glad you guys are our community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.